Back in 1979, the Lord lit a fire in my heart for whitetails that just grows stronger every year. And, you know, every time I look at that picture, I just, uh, I can't believe how many years it went by and all the lessons that, that I've learned since. But uh, I'm going to share a few of them lessons with you this morning. So I want to give you a little bit of history about myself. Uh, you know, when I was a kid, there wasn't such thing as outdoor TV or videos or anything like that. All we had was magazines and, and books. And I always dreamed of, of being an outdoor writer. Finally, in 1998, uh, that dream came true when North American Whitetail published my first article. Here's some of the magazines that um, my articles have appeared in over the years. I've had a few, a little over 100 articles published. And... Uh, just about every major magazine has had at least one of my articles in it. Uh, this is just a few of the, of the magazine titles that I've been in. Uh, there's now a handful of others. Uh, currently, these are the two magazines I write the most for, Deer and Deer Hunting and Quality Whitetails. In fact, I think the current issue of Deer and Deer Hunting, or the one that's just coming out now, will have one of my articles in it as well as the current issue of Quality Whitetails. So if you get either of those magazines, uh, you're, you're probably going to see one of my articles in it. And, in fact, Deer and Deer Hunting's got about six of my articles that are going to be coming out in the, the next few months. So you might look for those. One of my favorite articles I ever wrote, favorite how-to articles anyway, appeared in Peterson's Bow Hunting several years ago, and it was entitled Giant Steps to Giant Bucks. And in this article, I detailed twice in my hunting career where I learned something that just instantly made me a much better hunter. You know, we're always learning little tidbits here and there. And my goal for a lot of, for a lot of years has been just to end the season as a better hunter than when I started. And you always pick up little things each year. But there was twice whenever I learned something that just made me a much better hunter instantly. And one of those, I was about... 19 years old and I started a new job at, at Donnelly's in Mattoon and I kept hearing about this guy that was just a deer hunting guru killing big bucks right and left his name's Alan Foster so I, I sought out Alan and uh, became good friends with him and that first summer that I, that I met Al every time I'd get a break at work I'd, instead of going in the break room I'd run over and find Al and pick his brain about deer hunting and we'd pull out sheets of paper and we'd be drawing maps and this and that and the thing that he was always talking about was playing the wind. And one of the giant steps to killing big bucks consistently is learning to play the wind. And, you know, a lot of guys know that their scent can't reach the deer or the hunt's over. But what, you, what many of them fail to realize is that you've got you to consider how that buck plays the wind. Because he, he uses his nose the way you use your eyes. You know, none of you would, would go out here and close your eyes and drive home blind. And the buck is the same way. He's not going to give up the wind and get out of his bed and go commit suicide. If, he, if he's that stupid, he'd have never made it to be a mature buck. And playing the wind is just, it's a continual learning process. And Dan, if you want to key up that uh, video, I've got a video here of some different bucks and how they use the wind. And, uh, you know, I can sit here and, and try to explain it. But it's a whole lot better to show you. And all these bucks I filmed while hunting myself, uh, and they're all, it's 100% in the wild, and most of it's within 30 miles of where we sit right now. This buck's coming along a field edge, and as you can see with the leaves blowing there, the, the wind's blowing, and actually my scent is blowing right across that deer's back. He, that, that buck thinks the wind's in his advantage, and that's why he come by me. Uh, but the thing of it is, is I'm high enough and the wind's steady enough that my scent's blowing right over the top of this buck. And, and once he goes past, I'll be able to show you just a little bit better how he's using the wind. You can see he's traveling right down a field edge. And here in a second, you'll, you can start seeing the fence. And, and that wind is blowing, is quartering right into his nose. It's coming this direction, right into his nose. He's walking along with that wind blowing like this, and that allows this buck to scent everything that's in that cover. He's able to smell, and he can use his eyes to see everything outside. 
Now, if I was sitting in the cover, that deer would have smelled me and he'd have turned and he'd been gone. I'd have probably never seen him. Here's another buck doing the very same thing. The wind in this case is, and actually you could have just seen my arrow sticking there on my bow, but the wind is blowing out along that field edge. This buck's walking along. He, he's scent checking everything. Right here he sees my four-wheeler that's been parked out in the field a ways. And uh, I thought he was going to turn around. Here in a second, he's straight downwind. I mean, I think he catches just a hint of my scent. See there, he kind of locks up. It's like he just, just caught a touch of my scent. But my scent's blowing right over his back. And then I thought he, was, he came in like he was trying to get some more of that scent and passed on by. This buck uh, was four years old in this picture. I ended up shooting this buck last year when he was six years old. But as a four-year-old, he scored just a tad over 170 inches. And I, I found them sheds. Actually, I had three sets of sheds off this buck. But uh, it's a pretty good example of how these bucks run the edges where they can use their eyes in one direction and see everything there, and then they use their nose in another direction. Now, here's a, a different situation. We're going to see the same buck that I just showed you, and this is a different stand site. The first thing that happens is there's two small bucks come by, and these, these two small bucks work the outside edge. The big buck, he waits till the two little ones have sent checked that whole edge, and then he walks by right in front of me. I should have cut this tape down just a little bit shorter. It's just a little bit long here, but uh, there's two little bucks going to walk straight downwind of me. My scent's going to blow right over the top of them. Here comes the second one. And here's where everybody fails to see how to play the wind. You know, they, they consider what their scent's doing but they just ignore what the buck is doing. That, that buck's not going to get up and commit suicide. He's going to think everything is in his favor. The best way I ever heard it explained was the wind has got to be almost right for the buck and almost wrong for you. And uh, you're just playing a, a fine line there. And, and if it switches just a little, I mean, there's times I've been in my stand, the wind switched just, you know, 60 degrees and I got out of my stand and, and left and went to another place or gave up for the day because if the wind's wrong all you're going to do is educate that deer now here comes the big buck this is just you know maybe one minute after them two little ones come by this the bigger buck he lets the little bucks check things out down on the downwind side of me and then he stays in the cover now if he would have been coming by himself I can just about guarantee you he would have went on the outside like them little bucks did but he let them do the work and then he slips through in the cover. And you're going to see he comes within about five feet of my, the base of my tree. That would have been a pretty easy shot, I think. I could have probably even made that one. This buck, I actually, I got to know this buck better than any buck I've ever known in almost 40 years of deer hunting. Uh, I started filming him when he was two and a half years old and shot him last year when he was a six-year-old. I got three complete sets of sheds off of him, hours of video footage, hundreds of trail camera pictures. And he was just a homebody. He, he just, he didn't roam much. I only seen him off of my property once and he was chasing a hot doe just across the road and I come down the road in my truck and he runs her right back into to my place. So... This is not typical. I don't want anybody to think that I'm continually letting bucks walk like that every year. And uh, I knew that he was, by this point, I knew he was a homebody and that, that I could do that. And uh, there was a good chance uh, of him making it. And here he is the following year as a five-year-old. Between uh, four and five, he only put on three or four inches. And uh, what happened here was I'd seen another buck in the brush. And I tried to use my grunt call to grunt at that other buck because I didn't get a good look at him. Well, I, this buck was unseen. I didn't even know he was anywhere around, but he heard that grunt call. And he comes, and here you can see him. He's trying to get downwind of where, where he heard that call. 
But I was up high enough that my scent wasn't hitting the ground until it was way out in that field. So he comes out and he, he, he's using the wind downwind of where he heard that call, but yet my scent's still going over his back. And here in just a second, he actually jumps that fence and goes out in the field and works downwind of me trying to catch my scent and never does. But the other thing you've got to remember is you've got to, uh, you've got to have a steady wind. If the, if the wind is, is swirling or if it's not steady or if it's just barely blowing at all, your scent is going to sink a whole lot quicker. And those deer that are barely downwind of you, that's, that scent's going to go down instead of out. And it just takes years of experience learning how to play the wind like this. But the more... The, the first year after I met Alan Foster, whenever he was giving me all these lessons at work, uh, that very first year, I probably doubled the number of bucks that I'd seen the year before from my stand. And uh, it, it just, there was no doubt it was making a big difference in the amount of deer I was seeing. And I've just spent every year since then just trying to perfect uh, playing the wind. You know, during hunting season, if I'm driving down the road and I, I know I'm going to hunt that afternoon, it's just second nature for me to be watching for a flag blowing, which way it's blowing, for, for uh, somebody's burning something, the smoke. And the other thing I'm always watching is the, the, the uh, thermals. You know, if somebody's burning something and you see the smoke, is that smoke rising or is that smoke just kind of floating across the top of the ground? And if it's just floating across the top of the ground, that's exactly what your scent's going to do. It's just going to float out there where the deer can smell it. So er every stand that I've got is... You know, I've got probably close to 40 tree stands up, and, you know, I've got them detailed in a notebook, the exact wind I need for each one. And if I was going to hunt this afternoon, I have no idea right now which stand I'm going to this afternoon. I just, I wait till I'm ready to go to the woods, and if the wind's south, southwest, well, then I, I look at my list and see what's available. And, and then besides that, I've got them all. I know when they're going to be best. Some of those stands are best early in the season. Some are best during the rut, and some are best late in the year. So, you know, every time I go hunting, it's not just walking out in the woods to, to have a good time. I mean, it's a, it's a detailed approach, and, and it makes a, a huge difference in the number of deer I see and the size of the bucks that I'm able to, to kill. This buck here, this is filmed in the same tree that the very first clip I showed was. A friend of mine was going through a pretty rough time and, and uh, hadn't killed a buck in a couple of years. And he's pretty down in the dumps. And so I told him, I said, well, I got this wide buck that I wouldn't mind. He's, he's a fighter. You know, he's fighting all the other bucks on the property and running them off. And I don't really want to shoot him. But, you know, if you want to come out and give it a shot, you know, I showed him trail camera pictures of this deer so he knew exactly which one. And uh, I said, you just have to show up. And whenever you show up, I'll tell you which stand to go to. Well, the first day he shows up, first morning, I said, here's where you need to go this morning. Buck walks by the first morning, made me look like a genius. But it, it was just, I'm telling you, it was a, a big dose of luck, too. But here in a second, that buck passes, and you'll see him shoot the deer. I think this buck ended up uh, scoring in the mid-140s or something like that. But here's an ideal situation for hunting the wind. Uh, there's a, a very distinct edge between the, the thicket where the, the deer are and in the open country. And what them bucks will do when the wind is blowing out from the cover to the field, it, whether, it's quarter, whether it's straight out or quartering either direction, those bucks will run this edge. Now, every buck you're going to see here, I filmed in one morning on one hunt. And I don't even remember how many bucks I seen that morning, but they just ran that downwind edge of that cover just all morning long. As you could see, you know, it was a kind of an overcast day. It had rained the night before. And the, it was early November. The bucks were really on their feet. And uh, I don't even remember how many bucks I seen that morning, but it was several. Here comes another one. I actually ended up shooting this buck late in the year. He had a big spike on one side. I passed him up numerous times. Got down towards uh, the end of season. I still had two buck tags. So uh, I took him out. I didn't want him breeding any does with that one big spike on one side. 
but a lot of my stand sites, you know, people would see that stand. They think, well, why is he even hunting here? It, it's all based on the wind. Too many times hunters go out and, you know, all they're doing is they're just looking for deer sign. Wherever they see the most sign, they put their stand up. Maybe they watch the wind. Maybe they don't. If they do, they're just trying to get it to blow the other way. Well, that might be the direction the buck's trying to come from. And if that's the case, you know, they're just defeating themselves because that buck, it doesn't matter how much they use the area in front of your stand. Most of the time, them big bucks especially, they're going to scent check that area. They're going to come in there with the wind at their advantage. And once I learned to have faith in the wind instead of what my eyes seen, you know, instead of that visual sign, trusting what I'd learned with the wind and just hang my stands and hunt accordingly, the number of bucks I seen and the size of the bucks I shot just skyrocketed. And I don't I don't know how many bucks were on here, but the wind that morning was was out of the northeast, which was this direction. And sometimes the bucks will walk on the outside, the field edge side, and sometimes they walk inside the cover. You just never can tell. But if you this is really deadly in early November when the bucks are cruising looking for does. Just get on the downwind edge of that heavy cover. Get high enough on that edge where your scent's going to blow right over the top of them deer like happened right here. And, and it's just one buck after another. And at any, again, if I would have had my stand somewhere inside that cover, I would have never seen those deer. We got a question back here, Reuben? Uh, that... That's a pretty heavy uh, a piece. It's probably a quarter mile wide. It's basically the back side of a square 40. There's a, it's all wooded, but there's a house on the, the opposite side. No, it's not a corridor, but... Right, and the does like to bed in there, and then bucks can run that, that downwind edge, and if there's a hot doe in there, he finds her, you know, because he's got the wind to his advantage. If there's danger in there, you know, a buck uses his nose like we use, use our eye. Are we back to the beginning? Yeah, that was all for that one. A buck uses his nose the way we use our eyes. I mean, he uses his nose to find food, to find danger, and to find a mate. And, you know, we, we can't expect him to to go waltzing around and forget about his nose, be like us, you know, walking around blind. It just isn't going to happen. But, uh, you know, another thing, uh, a lot of us hunt fence rows in this open farm country. And when I'm on a fence row hunting, I want to hunt it with that wind hitting the fence row, you know, directly at a 90 degree angle. And I guarantee you every mature buck that walks down that fence row is going to be on the downwind side of that cover. Because anything that's in that fence row, he can smell it. And he can use his eyes on the open side. I've even been sitting on fence rows where there's, you know, a pit cornfield where you'd think the deer would be on one side and plowed field on the other. And them bucks will walk in that plowed dirt before they'll walk in that, that uh, corn stubble. I mean, the wind is just that important to them. And once you learn to respect a buck's nose and learn how to use that against him, that's when your, your uh, opportunities at shooting bigger bucks are going to skyrocket. Before I move on, has anybody got any questions? Any other questions about the? Yeah, it's probably that stand is about twenty to twenty-two feet, probably. And the older I get, the less I like to go up high. But uh, you got to get high enough to to be hid. If I'm in a tree with a lot of branches, you know, I, I'd say my lowest stands are probably about fifteen feet. Uh, the average is probably 20. I pro I've got some that are 25. But uh, I just like to be up where there's some branches and cover around me to kind of hide me. And also, depending on the layout and what the situation is, when there's a chance like on, on these clips where the buck can be downwind of you, then you need to be higher because that will allow that buck to pass on the downwind side and your scent blow out over the top of him. But, uh, yeah, that's good observation. That was pretty high. But, yep. That was the question. <laughs> you know, actually, I do hunt that stand a lot in the morning, and what I do is I just cut across that open. I'm always cutting across the open field right at the stand with the wind straight in my face. 
if it's a, a quartering wind to that edge, then I quarter right into that stand with the wind straight in my nose. Like, I'm, like I can smell the stand myself, and I'm just going straight into it. And... Uh, Yeah, and that, that's the other thing. You know, people are under the the impression or they, they think that a buck is always going to walk with the wind straight in their nose. Well, if they did that, then every deer here would be in Kansas, you know, in a month. And that just ain't going to happen. <laughs> the, the, but uh, another thing that they really like to do in the mornings is, like on a situation like that, if that buck was going to, uh, or any mature buck was going to bed in that thicket, what I've seen them do a dozens and dozens of times is they'll first before they go into that thicket they'll first run out or wherever they're going to bed it could be a crp field or anything before they're going to bed there they will run that downwind edge of that cover to scent check anything any danger that might be in there and then they'll make a j hook then they'll come back into that cover so you know the best way is, is get on that downwind edge and morning or evening you know they're, they're going to have the wind at their advantage if it's during the daylight yeah, Bob. If it's an injury, he won't pass it on. It's not genetic. I'm just a, a that buck. I he was three years old when I shot him, and he was like that the year before. So I just assumed that it was uh, genetic. And there was also another buck just a one year younger than him that had the very same thing on the very same side. And the, having the two bucks there, two different ages, kind of made me think it was a genetic thing. And I just wanted to get him out of there. You know, I still had two buck tags. I could use the venison, so he was a good one to take out. They can. There, it's... There's really no hard concrete rule one way or another. I don't know. Some of you realize I also raised a few deer that I've been, you know, I've had for close to 20 years now. And uh, so I've, I've got to watch firsthand a lot of bucks put on their rack year after year, same buck, you know, for four years. And there, there's just no rhyme to reason to what they do from one year to the next sometimes. They're just so individual like we are that it's just hard to say. But. Any other questions on hunting the wind? Well, that, that's the first step, the first of the giant steps that were detailed in that article. The, the second lesson that I learned was about sanctuaries. Do any of you guys have a big buck spotted for this fall that you, you're planning on trying to hunt? Just one? Oh, there's a few of you. I can promise you one thing about the buck you're trying to hunt this fall. He's got a sanctuary somewhere. There is some place that he has found where he can be safe. If, if he hadn't have found it, he'd have been killed by now. And if you can find that sanctuary, your odds of killing him are about 10 times better than if you have no idea where that is. And I, I discovered that a long time ago. So now I, when I find a buck that I want to hunt, what I do is I figure out where he's spending his daylight hours because uh, too many people are, re are looking for for rubs and scrapes, tracks, things like that. That tells you where the deer's been, but he might have been there at 2 in the morning, and that's not going to do you any good at all. You need to know where he's spending his daylight hours. And a lot of times where he's spending his daylight hours, he's bedded down. He's not on his feet making rubs and leaving sign, which kind of throws you for a loop. So, you know, it's through observation and, and trail cameras and things like that where you're trying to find where that buck spends his daylight hours. And uh, when, when you've got that pinned down... Uh, then your odds of killing him went way up. One, uh, both of these pictures happen to be taken in Moultrie County, right here where we are, on, and I got them both on trail camera. You can see the buck has got a, a radio collar and the doe has got a tag. And, uh, you know, you, you might wonder how some bucks live to, to older age classes and, and others don't. And I, I believe, it's just kind of my personal theory, that it all has to do with yearling buck dispersal. Whenever uh, some of these, these tests, these scientific tests with radio collars have proven that a young, when a doe has a buck fawn, if that doe is alive the following spring, when she has her next set of fawns, 
she will run that buck fawn off and he will relocate on average five to 20 miles from where he was born. And he may go farther, he may go 50 or 100 miles. He may only go three. But uh, he's going to relocate. It's Mother Nature's way of preventing inbreeding. If, if the mother's still alive, the males get pushed out and the female fawns will stay. But if that doe, if she gets killed during the fall, the same research has proven that her, her buck fawn will stay right where he was born 90% of the time. It just flip-flops. If she's alive, 90% of them are going to translocate at least five miles away. If she's dead, 90% of them are going to stay right where they're born. And I think what happens is these young bucks, as they, uh, as they disperse and, and find uh, their home range, their future home range, if they get fortunate enough to just, by luck, stumble onto a place where there's no hunting allowed or, or just happen to escape a place where they escape hunters, those are the bucks that I believe reach the older age classes. I don't think that, you know, some yearling bucks are smarter than other yearling bucks or anything like that. I think it, it's all luck. And this dispersal, I think, plays a big part of that. Where that yearling buck ends up uh, is going to, you know, that's going to determine his odds of making it to an older age class. Uh, and the research that's, that's being done, you know, a lot of it's being done right here locally. Uh, Southern Illinois University out of Carbondale comes up here and traps deer all around the lake. Uh, and they actually got some pretty amazing technology. This buck uh, that's got the radio collar on, I, I tracked down the people that was doing this research uh, to see if they might want the picture of him or whatever. They didn't need my picture because that, that uh, collar is a GPS collar. And the people down at SIU can get on their computer at any time and see where that buck is at exactly to the to the square foot through their GPS technology and and what their system does is all these bucks that they have radio collared it takes a reading every 12 hours and it plots it out on a big aerial map this buck actually when I got his picture he was nine miles from where they had tagged him as a buck fawn the year before they had tagged him right here on Lake Shelbyville but uh, he was several miles away when I got his picture uh, and, and I got his picture it was I think it was like five months later. So he had moved nine miles, and they actually sent me by email, you know, the aerial photo that showed the route that buck had traveled by his every 12-hour movement to get to, to where I got his picture at. And the other neat thing about it is in the fall when the, the buck's necks start to swell for the rut, that scientist or whoever's doing the research, he can just hit a button on his computer and release that collar and it falls off. Uh, in fact, this guy got a hold of me after he released this buck's collar to find out who owned a piece of land where it was at so he could get permission to walk in there and retrieve his collar. But uh, this research is not, you know, from states away. This research is happening right here in our own backyard. And it was about, I don't know, four or five years ago, I actually let them come to my property and, and uh, they netted and, and tagged some deer on my place. And uh, it was pretty interesting. It, it uh, takes all the guesswork about out of what these deer are doing. And, you know, in the olden days, these scientists, they had to go around with the little radio transmitters with a little antenna, and they'd drive the roads trying to find the buck they'd tag. And now they can do it all from their office, and they can, they can tell to the exact foot where that buck is at at any time. But, uh, again, I just think that is how them bucks end up getting to older age classes is when they disperse, they luck into finding a sanctuary and uh, that allows them to live to an older age. This, uh, you know, one of, one of the, uh, the best sanctuaries I ever found is a CRP field. It's just like the grass field I'm, I'm standing in here. I planted several acres of this on my place, and I found that the bucks would much rather bed in this grass than they would in the wooded cover. And they'll do the same thing. They'll, they'll run the downwind edge of that cover before uh, they go into bed and things like that. This buck in the picture, he was on my, my farm, I think it was in 2010, and I'd seen him a, a few times. I got several trail camera pictures on him, of him, and I wanted to kill him, and I was trying, and I, I seen him two or three times during the rut, but uh, two of the times that I seen him, he was in this grass field, bedded, and he would just stand up at dusk, but he wouldn't move 10 feet. He wouldn't leave that field until it was pitch black. 
And I wasn't sure that I was even going to get get a crack at this deer. He was he's pretty sharp. And then uh, in January, right at the last week of the season, we got a bitter cold spell. And one day I was in my stand hunting, and, and this buck came. There was like 50 deer feeding in these food plots in front of me. And the, uh, and the deer all came pretty much from one direction, uh, one block of cover, out to these food plots. And then right before dark, it was probably 30 minutes before dark, this buck shows up from a totally different direction all by himself, hitting them food plots. And I mean, the, the weather was like, in, it was zero out. It was below zero at night, you know, in the single digits during the, the day for several days. And when it's like that, them deer have got to feed and they're going to be out there eating. So, uh, you know, that cold weather got that buck on his feet and headed to them f food plots. And when I seen that happen, I knew where he was coming from then. And that was all I needed to know because I already had some stands in that direction for, for hunting any wind direction. So the next day I, I recruited my girl or my uh, daughter's boyfriend and uh, to, to run a video camera. I said, hey, I'm on a buck and I think there's a good chance I'm going to get a shot at him tonight. Come along and, and run the video camera. And I mean, it was, it was brutal cold. It was zero. And we're up in a tree 25 feet and ice all over the place and uh, wind blowing. Sure enough. Here comes the buck, just like I told him it would. Here he comes. The buck walks up 20 yards away from me. The guy, this kid has never filmed a hunt in his life. He's filming. I shoot right over the buck's back. There he goes. And I thought, this is over, you know. I just blew the golden opportunity. I've tried all year to hunt this buck. He turns the camera on me, and, I mean, it is so cold. I got ice froze all over my face. I'm going to do a little interview for the camera. Well, the season wasn't out, so I wasn't giving up. And the next day was Sunday, so after church, you know, I talked him into going out with me again. But the wind had switched, and uh, we was going to hunt a different stand. And I come in, and uh, we're walking along the edge of this grass. And as we're walking along the edge of this grass, I think to myself, you know, I've seen that buck bed in this field a couple times at least. I, I need to keep my eyes peeled as we walk along here. Maybe I'll see antlers sticking up. And I no more than thought that. I hadn't walked 50 feet, and I look up, and here's that buck bedded. I see these antlers, and uh, I end up shooting him in his bed, and I got video. So, Daniel, if you want to roll that beautiful buck footage, we'll, we'll have a look. <laughs> you can see his antlers right there. I just spotted him. I grabbed the camera out of the kid's pack, and I said, whatever you do, just keep this film rolling. And Because he couldn't see the buck. The buck was, the antlers were kind of, hidden in the grass there and he couldn't see it and I just told him to keep the camera on me and what's in front of me I kind of pointed to that building and, and said you know that deer is right in line with that corner of that building the snow had drifted up on that side of the field and, and made a bank and then it dropped straight off and where that that snow had dropped straight off and caused a bank that buck was bedded right on the the back side of that bank well you can see there's some wind blowing which covered my noise as well as uh, the snow and I walked through that snowbank, and when I got, got through the snowbank, that buck is bedded like from me to that wall, looking straight away from me, has no idea I'm within 100 miles. And I sat there and looked him over for a little bit before I shot, and I wish I would have had the cameraman come on behind me and get a little better angle. But here, he, he knows I'm getting ready to shoot, and he comes up, and you'll see there, I shot him, and that buck comes out of his bed. His first couple of bounds was right at me, and then... Uh, he runs out there and falls over. I hadn't, uh, you know, I hunted that buck hard all fall and hadn't been able to get a shot at him. And then I see him three days in a row when that, that cold weather hit late in the season and bucks got on the food. I seen him the first day, told me where he was coming from. The second day I missed him. The third day, I'll admit this is 100% luck just to, to see that deer. Because if we'd have went on to our stand, the odds of us ever seeing, we'd have probably seen that buck when he stood up. But we would have never been able to get a shot at him because we wouldn't have been between him and the food. But uh, fortunately for me and, and unfortunately for him, I did see him. So that's that. But that grass is just a fantastic sanctuary. So... Uh, 
you know, if you, if you see any CRP fields, even once that grass gets blowed over a little bit, those deer can bed around them clumps, and they're very difficult to see. So, so don't overlook them open grass fields and think you need to head for the trees or anything like that. Another thing that, that I always do when I hang a stand is, besides trying to pick the ideal location, as I try to look at what I can do to make a stand the very best it can possibly be, if a big buck happens to come by while I'm there, I want to make sure I'm getting a shot at him. In this stand right here, I, I've got a, a stand in this tree right back here on the edge. Right here is a creek. This, is, this drops straight down into a creek. But as you can see, there's a deer trail right here. And those deer, that's, that's too far for me to shoot. So what I did, I just simply put this picket fence up and then I piled a bunch of brush around it, which, which pushes all them deer. Now, I took this, this picture the day I built the fence before I even piled the brush up there. So now this, this trail, instead of going through here, this trail goes right up here and around. And when they do, they're 20 yards from my tree. J just little things like that, putting in that extra effort is what is, to mean the difference between seeing a big buck and killing a big buck. Here's another example. This is further down the same creek at another stand site. The deer, uh, they didn't really have a distinct crossing. They just crossed that creek here and there, and there was really not an easy place for them to cross. So what I did was I went in with my skid loader in the bucket, and I created a crossing. I just went to, on both sides of the creek. I've got a stand about 20 yards over here. And as you can see, the deer are really using that. So instead of taking a chance on maybe the deer crosses here, maybe crosses here, maybe crosses here, I concentrated all that activity over a long stretch of that creek. All that crossing activity is concentrated right here 20 yards from my tree. And, you know, going the extra mile like that to uh, do whatever it takes to make your stand the best it can be, again, it's the difference between seeing a big buck and killing a big buck. And when you combine this kind of thing with knowing a buck sanctuary and also knowing how to play the wind, that's when you can start dropping big bucks consistently. And you know, all the time I'll hear about uh, some guys killing big bucks con all, on a fairly regular basis, and other guys in the area aren't, and the other guys in the area are saying, well, that guy must be a poacher, or he's shooting him in a pen, or he's doing this, he's doing that. Now what he's doing is he's going out and he's putting the extra effort in at every one of his stand sites and learning you know, what he needs to do to get it done. And most of the time, that, that's the case. The guy's really not a poacher. He's just giving it the extra effort. Anybody remember this buck? This is, uh, when I shot this buck in 2004, he was the biggest buck killed in Moultrie County. Uh, but there was some controversy involved. The neighboring landowner apparently was after this buck and, and uh accused me of, of trespassing and as you can see by the the headlines you know i ended up getting the buck back but I had quite a battle for the buck the story th this whole story i could stand here the rest of the day and tell you stories in regards to this deer and, and i'm actually going to tomorrow morning uh i'm going to be talking here at church and and this story of this buck is going to be one of the things i'm talking about and we don't have time for me to really get into all this today and get sidetracked with this but uh if you want to hear the, the story and all the details of this deer, I'm going to invite you to church tomorrow right here. Show up and you'll hear the details. One thing this deer did for me, though, which is going to lead to the next slide, is it opened all kinds of doors. These guys were out to destroy me. And uh, what they did is basically gave me all kinds of recognition that I never would have got otherwise. And, and that led to me writing a couple of books. Um, you've probably seen the books out here on the table. Uh, we're selling them today. All the proceeds are going to Skip's Men's Ministry. So, uh, you know, on your way out, if you haven't already, be sure to, to stop by and check those out. Here are, uh, these are some of the bucks I've killed here in recent seasons. Uh, I just threw these on here for, a, you know, a question and answer period. If anybody's got any, any questions before we move on, we got one last slide. But uh, before we move to that one, I want to take any questions anybody has. Yeah, Bob? That, there's a combination of three grasses in that field, uh, big blue stem, Indian grass, and switchgrass. All uh, are, are taller species. They'll get six to eight foot tall. 
So uh, we sell those. I wasn't going to turn this into an infomercial or anything, but if anybody's interested, uh, you can you can get a hold of me later, and uh, I'll, I'll be glad to give you the details. One thing I found about those grass fields is the bigger the better. Um, you know, the previous question regarded us selling seed, and we sell a lot of seed to native grass seed to guys that are trying to plant small fields, two or three acres of this grass, in hopes of getting bucks to bed there. And from what I've seen, you need at least five acres, and that's even better. I'd, I'd take 60 in a heartbeat. But uh, the bucks are going to basically do the same thing they're going to run the downwind edge of that. And, uh, and those grasses need to be burned every two or three years in the spring. And so what we do is plant uh, clover strips around the edge of them so the fire doesn't get away. And those clover strips are just become deer highways. And especially for those bucks, you know, when they're going into bed, just like I said earlier, they're going to, they're going to walk that downwind edge and they're going to J-hook back in. If they're, in, if they're looking for does, they're going to walk that downwind edge because they can smell everything out in that field. So it's basically the same approach. You just you get on the downwind edge of that cover and you just have faith. Just because you don't see a big rub or something in front of your stand, don't let that discourage you. You know, take faith in the wind. Either a work that the buck that we seen on the first video that I I'd watched for four or five years and shot as a six-year-old, I shot him out of an elevated tower stand on the edge of these grass fields. So, yeah, that, that'll work. They'll get used to that sitting out there. But the wind is so key. I mean, I would rather be sitting on a five-gallon bucket and, and wide open and have the wind right than I would be hitting a tree and have the wind wrong. But, yes, sir. Uh, predators, you know, I used to think coyotes were no threat to deer, but then I, I had a bunch of coyotes move into the section where I live. And last fall, I had a trapper come in. They got so bad, and my, my deer numbers, my deer sightings were like half. And I don't attribute that all to the coyotes. But uh, he came in, and he caught 14 coyotes, and, and I shot three, and a friend of mine shot one. So we killed 18 coyotes in uh, just one little stretch there in a section. And once they were gone, I, you know, I started seeing more deer. I don't know if they were killing the deer as much as they were harassing them, and the deer just, they didn't like the pressure, so they just moved on. But, but deer do, or uh, coyotes will prey on the fawns, I know that, or hard on the fawns. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. I would much rather be up in the air where you can see. You, you can just see the bucks coming and prepare for the shot a whole lot better. You know, if you're in the ground blind and, and that deer shows up, he's probably right in front of you. Well, then, if you don't have your bow in hand and everything else, yeah, it's real hard to uh, to get it ready. Just, I definitely prefer tree stands. Anyone else? Yeah, Jim. No, I got that one series of three pictures of that bobcat, and that was the only bobcat that I've ever got a picture of or ever even knew about in our area. So I do know of, of a lot of bobcat sightings and pictures, you know, in this area in the last two or three years. So I, I do think they're coming this way from the south, and we'll, we'll see more and more of them. I'm not a bit surprised. We're going to see more and more of them. I mean, when I was a kid, we didn't see coyotes. I mean, I remember the first coyote I seen, you know, I was probably 13, 14 years old. And you seen a coyote, people thought you was, you was lying to them if you told them. So I think it's the same way with the bobcats. They're now coming on like the coyotes did 40 years ago. Yeah, I do too. Exactly. Any other questions? Yes, sir.
and when did I get permission? Just right then and the season's open or? The first thing I do is get on Google Earth and look at the property from the air and uh, look at also the surrounding properties. I would try to, the most important thing with deer is to know where they're bedding during the day. You gotta, to, to kill a deer legally, you gotta hunt him where he spends his daylight hours. And that's what the biggest mistake I think a lot of people make is they're spending the, their time hunting where the deer's leaving its sign at night. So I would try to determine where, that, where the deer are bedding at and looking at the aerial photo I'd try to pick out some potential stand sites I would not want to stomp the property you know every square acre to, to find where to hang my stands I'd like to to start with an aerial photo hang two or three stands that way use them as observation if you're not if you're in the right spot great you know the hunts on if not you can use what you see during those hunts to maybe fine-tune your stand location and get in position to kill them Does that answer your question or Okay. Anybody else? You know, that was one of them secrets I was going to keep to myself. But <laughs> actually, when I started hunting, if, if there was a cattle pasture with cattle, and even if that pasture was wooded, you just didn't see deer in there. They, they stayed away. But in recent years, more and more, if there's a pasture that's got cattle in it, hunters tend to avoid it. And if there's just a little bit of brush, you know, maybe some multiflora rose bushes or whatever, that is a super place for a big buck to hide out. Because when we talk about a sanctuary of security, basically all he's wanting is freedom from human intrusion. He can handle a coyote that comes along or whatever else, but he don't ever want to encounter a human or human scent. And he'll go wherever he has to to do that. If it's in the middle of a cattle pasture, that's where he'll go. And today, I wouldn't hesitate to go put a stand in a cattle pasture if I had reason to believe there was a big buck using it. So, anyone else? Yes, sir. Yeah, I have no doubt about it. Um, I, I don't. I think we don't give bucks enough credit as, for being individuals. Some bucks, it's going to take one flash and he's gone. He's never coming past there again. Other bucks, same age, mature bucks, they'll walk by that camera day after day and it won't even bother them. But uh, I've seen, I had a situation several years ago where I had a, a fence crossing in front of my stand and I had a trail camera covering that fence crossing. And uh, one day I was hunting in it in the evening and the, the deer were just filing out right through that fence crossing to go feed in the in the field. And... No, no problem. And the wind was perfect for them, perfect for me. The wind was blowing back away from the fence crossing from the tree I was in. There, along comes a, a three-year-old buck. And I thought, well, he's going to walk by. I'll get some good video footage. I wasn't going to shoot him. But he walks up about from here to the wall from that fence crossing, and he just locks up and he freezes. And he just stood there for three or four minutes looking. And he just watched the does in front. There was does in front of him. He just watched them walk right out and start feeding. But... And after standing there and just watching that opening for three or four minutes, he circles around behind my tree, downwind of my tree, jumps the fence, ends up scenting me and blowing out of there. I have no doubt that that buck knew that trail camera was there, and that's what spooked him. Because uh, if he'd known I was there, he would have never walked up to up there to begin with. But for some reason, he wouldn't cross, and that was a wide open opening. And for some reason, instead of walking through that wide open opening after watching them does do it, he went around and jumped a fence. And I'm convinced it was the trail camera. Bob? Well, to start with, I just start thinking like a deer. Where would I go if I was living in a certain area? You know, where would I go where I'm least likely to encounter a human? And at the, but at the same time, I also think in terms of thick cover, the thicker the cover, the better, whether it be a grass field of, you know, briars, whatever, 
they, they much prefer to bed in thick stuff, but they'll bed right out in a wide open cornfield and corn stalks, you know, where there's not even a tree in the whole section if that's the safest place for them to be. So, you know, I start looking for bedding type cover, real thick stuff, but I'm always keeping in mind that that, that might not be the right spot, but, that, but that's a good place to start. Uh-huh. Well, another good way to, to do it is when there's snow on the ground, you know, in January and February, right after hunting season, go out there and look for the beds in the snow. But, you know, for a guy just to go out and get permission for a, for a new property today and want to hunt it this year, they always say that the third year you hunt a property is when you should start killing the big deer. The first two years, all you're doing is learning. And you may luck into one, yeah, but it's that third year is when you can start figuring on consistently killing the good ones and learning things like where they bed is is what you're doing that first two years Reuben Yeah, that's exactly right and a very good point. A sanctuary is only going to be a sanctuary as long as you allow it to be. And a lot of times it only takes one jaunt through a, a bedding area and it's no longer a bedding area. So, you know, once you find one, especially if you own the property, then you can create them thick areas and stay out of them. I've got them on my property and I only go in once a year. Like, I haven't been in the thick stuff on my property since spring and I won't go in unless I shoot a deer and it goes in there this fall. I won't be back in there until once this spring. And if I am going to go in, I, I do it, you know, I got some work to do, like the fence you've seen that I built or the, the creek crossing. I go in there and I get all that work done at once. I don't make drag it out and go in and out for a month getting things done. I wait till I've got the time to spend the whole day or two days, whatever it takes, get it all done, get out and stay out. And a lot of times I try to time that to be the same time when you would want to look for shed antlers. You can go in, look for shed antlers, do your work, get out. It's a sanctuary. You know, I mean, it might take a little bit to settle down. And what I've seen is a big difference when I first started working on my property. If I jump a deer, he headed out across open country to the next timber a mile away. Today, if I jump a deer on my place and he's in the cover, all he does is run to the other side of the cover. He doesn't want to leave my place because it's become a sanctuary. And as time goes on and as the deer become accustomed to that, I think a doe can even you know, teach her fawns that this is a safe place to be. And as long as you let it remain that way, it just gets better and better and better. If you think of a state park, you know, a state park is basically a sanctuary, you know, where no hunting's allowed. And, uh, you know, they've done nothing special at those state parks. All they did was shut it off to hunting, which keeps a lot of the human traffic down. The, the deer get used to what's going on there, and it becomes a sanctuary. But uh, Reuben made a very good point, you know, stay out. you got a place like that, stay out of it, and the deer will, will keep using it. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. No doubt about it. And it gives them, you know, two routes of escape. If, if something's up on the ridge that spooks them, they just go right down the bottom. And if something's down the bottom that spooks them, they just go right over the ridge. Yeah. Well, for one thing, I don't ever put the trail cameras close to where I'm going to have a tree stand, and uh, I will. Uh, I'll just drive my four wheeler right up to them, but. Uh, I'm setting my trail cameras more for night movement. I just want to see what's there. I'm not trying to pinpoint him to where I'm going to kill him. I just want to see what's on the property to see if there's something big enough for me to hunt. 
so I'll, I'll set you know trail cameras out on you know fence lines leading out of away from a sanctuary or whatever and I'll just ride my four-wheeler right up there and check them that way because deer you know they're used to human you know, traffic to some degree farmers out in their fields or you know checking their crops or whatever so as long as you stay out of their bedding area you can get away with some intrusion I like Reconics myself. They're pretty expensive, but I've had really good luck with them. You know, they just, they're dependable as can be. The batteries will last forever. And uh, when I go, I can leave one out for six months and go back and I know it's still working. So that's my preferred brand. I just assume they not even know I'm there because, uh, and that's another uh, another good point. You know, guys want to go and they want to buy all these scents, cover scents, and attracting scents. A big buck, a mature buck, is already so he's a survival machine, and he's so alert and so in tune to what's going on. Even if he smells your scent, all you've done was just heightened his awareness to what's going on. It makes it harder to draw on him, harder to get off a shot. I would just assume. Uh, have him come by and never have an idea that I'm anywhere around. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, to give you an exact number, I, I some. You know, every place that I hunt, I own a property, and, and it's the best property I've ever hunted. But I've made it that way. It was nothing when I started. But, uh, you know, I, I cut my deer hunting teeth right out here on the core ground. I've probably been in just about every wooded piece of cover between Mattoon and Shelbyville, between the Bruce Finley Road and Route 16. You take that big corridor, and I bet you I've been in every piece of woods there at some time or another over the last 40 years. And uh, I've killed some on the core ground, but any more, you know, I, two years ago I was hunting on core ground. I didn't last season, but the season before I did, I still hunt on the core ground. And the, the key there is you just got to figure out where everybody else is going and you got to go somewhere else. And you got to do whatever and whatever they're doing. You just got to, if you do what everybody else does, you're going to get what everybody else gets. Those bucks on the core ground, they'll move a lot more during the middle of the day because they're used to that morning and evening hunter, you know, being out there. So if I was going to go hunt core ground, I'd hunt a lot more in the middle of the day and I'd just go wherever I needed to go to get away from everybody. Roger. Well, I agree what you say about the rut. I had a friend that he used to say uh, during the rut, anybody can kill a buck, a good buck from any tree in the woods. It's just a matter of being there at the right time. It's just who knows where they're going to show up and when they're going to show up. During the early season, the key is those bucks are still on a feeding pattern. The one I killed last year, you know, he was coming to feed in a clover 
uh, fire break along a native grass field. So uh, I, I think there's no doubt key, uh, food is the key early. But you need, to be, you need to be able to get on that pattern without disturbing the deer. And a lot of times that means you've got to have your stand in place before the buck starts using that pattern. I have all my stands in place right now. I put them in, put my stands up in the spring right after hunting season. When the woods start to green up in the spring, I'm ready to go. When I go walk into my stands this fall, it'll be the first time that I've been there in six months. And if from a distance I can observe a buck feeding in a, in a certain location in the evening, and I've already got a stand set up to take advantage of that, and I've got a chance to kill him. If I've got to go in there and put a stand up and, and trim shooting lanes and everything else, my odds of, of killing that buck are probably about 25% or less of what they had if, if all i got to do is slip in. Because when you do that, every time you go in there, you're creating disturbance, you're leaving human scent and everything else. And if I've got the stand ready, there's never been any human scent left there since the spring. The first time I'm leaving human scent is the day I climb up in the tree to shoot the deer. So... I don't, you know, there's a big degree of luck in the early season, too. I think the time to kill big deer is late season. You get them on them food sources when you got a brutal cold spell come through, and they're going to be there, and they're not going to wait till dark. And I don't care how nocturnal the buck was, he's got to eat to stay alive. And that's one thing uh, that's changed since I wrote my first book. If you read uh, what I say about the late season in the, in the first book, I've totally changed my opinion on that. And the buck I shot last year was shot on October the, the 5th on my third hunt of the, the year. That's the first early season buck I've shot in a long time. The five, in fact, he's the buck down here in the bottom uh, right-hand corner, the one I shot last year early. But all the rest of those four bucks were shot after Christmas. And I think, uh, I think I'd shot six bucks in a row after Christmas. And I... Anymore, if, if I know where there's a, a monster buck and he makes it through the shotgun season and I know there's a good food source in that area, I'm just praying for a zero-degree cold spell to hit because I know that's, that's going to get that buck on his feet. So. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely the evenings. In fact, uh, evenings are by far my favorite uh, clear through the entire season with the exception of probably the first... Well, from about the 5th of November to, say, the 12th, there's about a one-week period there where the bucks are running heavy in the morning. And they will, you know, here and there all the time during the morning. But evenings have always been way more consistent for me, seeing bigger deer. In fact, I, I can't even tell you the last time I hunted a morning in October or a morning in December or January. I just, I think you, all you're doing when you go out there is you're just tipping them deer off to uh, where your stand's at uh, because they're going to, when they come into bed a lot of times outside of the rut, a lot of times they're going to be bedded down before it's even daylight. So then you come stomping in there and either you, you, the buck's still on his feet and you run into each other in the dark and maybe not even know it and you just put him on red alert. But in the evening time, if you have done your homework and you know what's going on, you know exactly where that buck is bedded. There's not no, you know, debate on which direction he's coming from. You know he's here and he's stationary. The only th you just got to get in as close as you can to him and get in your stand with the wind direction favorable for you to get there and favorable for him to get up and move. And if you can do that, then you got a much better chance than trying to slip in in the morning. So, and I, I hunt just about every morning the, the whole month of November, but I much prefer evenings. Yes, sir.
Well, to be completely honest, the older I get, I'm really liking them in closed blinds and, uh, and propane heaters. <laughs> but, but that's not always. And the, the thing of it is, you can set up for afternoon hunts with them too because the other thing about the late season there's no, you know exactly where that buck's coming from, and you know exactly where he's going, and you know exactly when he's going to do it. He's going to do it in the afternoon right before dark. So you don't have to be out there like you do during the rut and, and you know, get to your stand before daylight and sit till noon or all day or whatever. You can go out there and hunt the last two hours and know that you're there at the right time. All you've got to do is beat the does so you don't bust them, which busts him. But, uh, you know, as far as clothing, I just use... Uh, you know, expedition weight, uh, long underwear, and and put layers on and, and things like that. And there you go. And, and a lot of them hot hands. Reuben? I don't have one, but I've heard a lot of good things about them. Anybody else? Yeah. Alvy? I don't even have a iPhone or smartphone or whatever you call it. I, I'm more of the jitterbug. Hold it out at arm's length and, and, and I hope you deal, dial the right number. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, I don't have any phone apps. <laughs> Yeah, the only thing I would, would say about that is, you know, there's some uh, weather websites out there that are supposed to be, you know, up to date by the minute or whatever. And, uh, and I've found them to be so inaccurate that I quit even using them. That's why the weather vane that you've seen in that one photo is actually at my house. I don't, it's there for one reason. That's just so I know which tree stand to go hunt out of. And, you know, I don't have any idea what's being used to get the information on that app that you're talking about. But, you know, a website... They're getting their information from a, a weather station somewhere, and it might be 10 miles from where you're at. And it, the wind is so critical that I'm not willing to take a chance on a reading 10 miles away that this little gadget's give me. I just see it with my own eyes. And I'm not saying it don't work. If it works good for you, by all means, keep using it. But uh, I guess I just haven't advanced that far in technology yet, I just as soon see the weather vane blowing and that'll tell me where I'm going. But there you go. Any other questions? Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
Not at all. In fact, I I prefer to shoot a deer at about 20 yards, 15 to 20. I don't really like them less than 10 for sure because of the shot angle. But uh, even if he comes by your stand, like the one buck we seen where my bow's hanging there and the, the buck's right below, you know, once he went past, I could have got a quartering away shot at, you know, 12, 15 yards or whatever, and uh, it would have worked out fine. But if when you're playing the wind, you're right. A lot of times you've got to get right on top of where that deer's coming through, and you've got to get high. So... Any other questions? be just uh, brutally honest a lot of that comes down to who your game warden is and who you are so you know I, I had somebody else ask me that question this week you know they heard that food plots are now illegal in Illinois I haven't heard anything about it and I don't see how they could do that but I guess they can do whatever they want but <laughs> yeah, I'm probably not one to advise you on on which way to to go in regards to the DNR. Yeah, you're right. I, I'd just call your local CPO and ask them because that, that's basically who the call is going to come down to anyway. He's going to be the one to decide whether to give you a ticket or not. And If you do talk to one, let me know what he says because I'd like to know. But Yeah, me too. Afraid of what they might tell me too. So, But any more questions? Yes, sir. Well, what are you, your shots are going to be a whole lot closer and you're moving from a tree to the ground? Yeah, I really don't have a whole lot of experience in that. But, you know, what I can tell you is there's a lot of products for trying to cover your scent. I don't trust any of them, even the clothing that's supposed to, you know, absorb your scent or whatever. I'm sure it works to a certain degree, and it might keep a buck from smelling you 100 yards away, but once he gets up to 10, he's still going to smell you. So, again, you know, I just play the wind. And if, if a buck is downwind of you, I just figure he's going to smell you. It's just at what distance he's going to smell you. And uh, if he's upwind of you, there's no way he can smell you. If, if the wind is strong enough to be blowing your scent the other direction, a scent molecule's got to reach his nose before he can smell you. So you just got to maneuver around to, to make sure the wind's in your favor. Any other questions? Uh, it's just the, the tendency of a big buck, the nature of them. They want to be close to that cover. Usually they are no farther out in that field. They're not. They're trying to send everything in there. And it's just a fine line where you can get away with this. If, if my stands were, say, 20 yards further into the cover, there's a good chance a lot of them bucks running that edge would smell me that, that are not right now. But, but a mature buck, he doesn't want to be out 50 yards in the field because he's, he's so much farther. If he does encounter danger, he's so much farther from cover. If he's walking that field edge and he encounters something, he just immediately turns around and goes the other way or he jumps into the cover, you know, what, whatever's required of him. So I have never really seen that to be an issue. Anyone else? 
If that's it, we're going to move on to the last slide. I'd like everybody to take a look at this picture and just think to yourself, what do you see when you look at this picture? Do you see some lucky kid with his first buck? Do you see some kid wearing a funny hat or what is it? And the reason I ask this question, I've, I've given these seminars in five states now, and every seminar I've ever given, I've ended with this photo and this, this question to the audience. And I can bet you that no matter what you see when you look at this picture, nobody sees what I see. <laughs> when I see this picture, I see my dad. Now, my dad, he was with me when I shot this first buck. But he wasn't a deer hunter. He didn't teach me how to read deer sign or anything like that. But uh, he taught me that what we was going to do, we was going to do it right. And, you know, one, one story from, from my youth serves as a perfect example. And back in these days, 1979, you just didn't get a deer permit every time you wanted one. You had to uh, apply in the spring. And sometimes th there was more people applying than there was actually permits available. So some years you didn't get a permit. Well, I went to school and was talking to my buddies one day about, uh, about this situation. And one of my friends told me that, you know, his dad would apply for permits for everybody in the family. And, you know, they'd send in a permit application for his mom and his little brother and sisters and who all. And this pretty much assured them that they would, somebody would get a permit and my friend and his dad would get to go deer hunting every year. Well, I just thought this was a brilliant idea. And I couldn't wait to get home and tell my dad, you know, I've got a way for us to, to all get to go deer hunting. And, boy, I wasn't prepared for his response. He wasn't impressed at all. Yeah. He let me know in, in short order that we was going to be doing things right or we wasn't going to be doing it at all. And, you know, I, I spend a lot of time working booths at deer shows across the country every winter. And I, I get to meet a lot of young kids come up and talk to me and about deer hunting and this and that. And I can just sit there and have a conversation with some young kid and, and not even ask him about his dad or anything like that. And within about five minutes, I can tell you the character of his dad because it's going to be reflected in that sun. And if his dad's one of these, if it's brown, it's down, lock them, stack them, anything goes, bend the rules to, to fit the situation. If his dad's one of them people, that young man's going to reflect that when he's talking to somebody, even when his dad's nowhere around. And my dad was not that way. We was going to do things right, or we wasn't going to do it. And I've often wondered, you know, what... Uh, what if my dad would have been one of them guys that just did anything? If, as long as we can get away with it, it's okay. You know, I probably wouldn't be, I, I wouldn't have, I've never written a hundred magazine articles and had them published. And yeah, you know, probably I wouldn't have wrote two books. And I probably wouldn't be here in front of you today. But, uh, you know, my, the big reason I'm here today is because of my dad. And like I said, I've, I've used this, this last slide and that question to the audience in every seminar I've ever given. And my, my dad had no idea that I did that until right now. I'd, I'd like for my dad to stand up. And I'd, Thank you. Yeah, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have been able to do half what I've been able to do. And, you know, I just want to thank him for that and recognize it. And I see a lot of young kids here today, you know, with their fathers. And I think just think that's awesome. If, and I've actually, I've got a message just for the youth that's here today because I see plenty of, of you sitting in here. You know, it's just natural when you're young to have heroes. You know, it might be an athlete, you know, if, if you're into baseball, maybe you've got a baseball player that you look up to. 
or you know it's just it could be anybody you know it'd be a race car driver maybe you like hunting so you you watch the outdoor channel and there's somebody on there that you like and that you look up to as your hero but uh you know something to keep in mind is these heroes that you guys look up to if you would meet them on the street they wouldn't even know your name more than likely they wouldn't i mean they wouldn't know your face who you are or anything and, I, and I'd like to suggest a, a better hero for you. The, the next time that you're sitting at home and, and you're, you're sitting at the dinner table or whatever, take a good look at the, the man and the woman sitting across from you, your mom and dad. You know, the Bible tells us to, to honor our mother and father for good reason. Uh, your mom and dad, not, they not only know your name, they gave you your name. Not only did they give you your name, they gave you life itself. And if it came down to it, they would give their life for you. Everything you got, the clothes on your back, the food that you eat, your mom and dad's responsible for. So I'm not saying there's something wrong with having a hero that, that uh, you know, to look up to. But if you want to find a real hero, just look across the dinner table tonight. Take a look at the man and the woman there. There's your real heroes. And it might take you a few years to realize that, but someday you're going to remember these words that I spoke today, the real hero is the, the man and the woman sitting across from you that, uh, that gave you life. And, uh, you know, and, and as far as the fathers go, and the older guys in here, you know, we're called to be leaders, leaders of our family, uh, and that includes spiritual leaders. Uh, you're, if you want to know what your kids are going to be in, in 20, 25 years, just take a good look in the mirror. Because whatever you are today, your kids aren't going to be too far from that in the future. So uh, I just encourage all of you to be, to be good leaders. And I'm not looking down on anybody because I don't know your situation. And I've made plenty of mistakes in the past. If I could go back and start over at 20 years old, you know, I, I think I would have been a lot better example to my kids than, than what I have, am right now. But, uh, you know, eventually I'm getting there. And, but... As you sit in your tree stands this fall, you know there's a lot of hours we sit there between deer sightings when we're just sitting there with our thoughts. And, uh, you know, this fall's not going to be any, any different. We're all going to be sitting there for hours. When we're not watching deer, we're just sitting there thinking. And, and I just encourage you to think about the kind of leader and especially the spiritual leader that you are to your family. Um, this week is back to, back to church Sunday. Uh, tomorrow, and like I said before, I'm going to be speaking. Uh, if you don't have a church that you regularly attend, uh, I invite you to come here tomorrow. We start at 10 o'clock, and uh, be my special guest. You know, I'll, I'll be out in the lobby to to greet you, bring your family, go home and surprise your wives. If you're not currently going to church, you go home tonight and, and tell your wife that you're taking her and the kids to church in the morning and see what that does to her. And <laughs> She'll wonder where you've been all morning, but maybe think you've been to a psychiatrist or something, but you can tell her you've been to church. and You know, you don't have to have fancy clothes. I think there's only been one time I've come to church and I wasn't in blue jeans. Uh, you can wear T-shirts. I guarantee you there's going to be people in T-shirts tomorrow here at church. And uh, it's camo Sunday tomorrow. Yeah, you're going to see a lot of camo here tomorrow. So, uh, you know, as... And even if you don't come to church tomorrow, I just want you to have it on your minds this fall as you're sitting in your tree stands thinking. Just just consider the uh, the example you're setting for your kids because, uh, you know, you, you never know what your kids are going to turn out to be. I guarantee you the day that, that I shot this buck, my dad had no idea that 34 years later he's going to be sitting in church and I'm going to be standing in front of the church talking to the crowd. In fact, he's probably... He, I would have probably shocked him if I had told him last week I was going to be in front of the church talking to a crowd. But, you, you know, you just you never know what your kid is going to end up, the situations they're going to be in life later down the road. And uh, I, I just encourage you to all be uh, good leaders of your family. And and it doesn't matter if you got sons or daughters, either one. You know, personally, I just got two girls, but that doesn't uh, relieve me of my responsibility to be a good leader. Uh, just because they're not interested in hunting or anything, they're still looking at me and the values that I instill in them. And we can talk to them all we want. We can encourage them 
with our words, but it's our actions that's really going to make a difference in their life. They're going to take a look at you, and what they see out of you is going to carry a lot of weight. So that's pretty much all I've got to say. Uh, I appreciate you guys all coming out today. I, like I said, I'd love to see you back tomorrow or, or any time. And uh, Skip, I think, has got a few door prizes. Somebody might even walk out of here with a bow. So, so I'm going to turn it over to Skip. Thank you, guys.